All right. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be in time and the space. Kenius, the Sky Dude, back again, and uh, we are at Shiprock. We're doing a go west cross country. And uh, we started out in Colorado Springs yesterday and made it all the way over here to, well, we cut across the corner of New Mexico. And although today we're probably going to be going more south than west, but we'll eventually get back on, on track. I went ahead and uh, took care of a lot of things this morning to get us going a little bit faster, hopefully not a long delay to start. So uh, first thing I did is I kind of plotted some areas that we want to want to go today. I want to go down here, and I guess there's some mountains that we want to look at over here, and I want to cut back into New Mexico and kind of skirt along and through Chaco Canyon, okay? And then from there, we're going to go to Albuquerque, and the reason why I ended up wanting to go to Albuquerque, one, because it's cool, and they got, you know, cool airport and uh, yada, 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 but not too far from there, I discovered what's called the Very Large Array. And it's a large array of space telescopes, right? So we're going to come down from uh, Albuquerque down here and then cut over and check out those, the very large array. And then, since White Sands, the uh, the missile launching ground where uh, they've detonated a bunch of nuclear weapons in the past, um, that's nearby. So I thought, well, let's just kind of skirt over there near Trinity, where uh, one of the first ones was at. And then I set myself up with a job down here. And then tomorrow, I figured we'll um, start making our way back west again and cover anything over here in New Mexico. So yeah, I mean, we could just keep heading west, but, you know, part of the joy of doing these cross countries is seeing things we've never seen before. Kind of like ship rock out there. In front of us that was a neat story yesterday so the sky gods came down and dropped a bunch of people to live out here and they were all living comfortably on this mountain until lightning hit it they said lightning and now there's nobody up there but ghosts you're not supposed to go up there because of the ghosts how massive would the lightning have to have been to have decimated a place where civilization used to live up on top of and now it's all just jagged peaks Right, crazy. All right, I already got bush talk set up to go, and today uh, I've got it. So yesterday, when I was using this, it was uh, when I would switch over to the screen, it would black out. So I apologize for yesterday. Um, if you have another tab open on the same browser window, for example, if I open another tab in this window uh, with bush talk and it and try to go back to it. It either doesn't come up or it's blank, and it doesn't display the window properly. So I apologize for that yesterday. So we had periods of black screen. It's always something, right? All right, well, I've been sitting out here a while, so I don't know if she's going to start once we get into the plane and get going. Uh, and I've already set us up with a job. Like I said, I've already gone ahead and and uh, set us up with the... Uh, the proper fuel and the proper payload so we get paid when we get down there. And the airport that we're going to, it had a really neat name, and I couldn't pass it up. It was uh, Truth or Consequences. The airport is called Truth or Consequences. Figured, well, that's neat. Okay, so let's see if uh, this thing will start and, and move. In the last few days, once we've sat for a while and got started up, um, she... The brakes don't want to disengage or whatever. It doesn't want to move. So we might have to reset ourselves on the runway. But we'll see what happens. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. I could definitely use all your help. I'm making like three bucks. Right? All these videos. Yeah. Three bucks. So with your help, I could make... Three dollars and one cent. So please, 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 please. Every penny counts. So please like and subscribe. I am so excited for this weekend. I uh, haven't been going to the comedy club regularly. Money's been really tight. And that's like one of my super guilty pleasures. I really love going to the comedy club. One of my favorite comedians out there. His name is Zoltan. Sounds like a magician, doesn't it? The amazing Zoltan. Uh, well, Zoltan's, uh, you know, 
of foreign. Uh, his mother was foreign. He's American. I don't know why he even said that. But uh, he's coming back to town, and he's absolutely one of my favorites. So I'm going to splurge this weekend and go out to the comedy club tomorrow night. Very happy about that. All right. Um, still haven't got the uh, music thing entirely resolved with Pretzel. And so as much as I would love to play the music today until I'm certain that they've worked things out, um, I don't want to play any music today. And I'm terribly sorry about that. I, I love having music when we're on these flights. We've got such a great selection, too. Headphones on here. Take the break off. It'll probably help. This guy's like, come on, man. Not getting anywhere. Wake up. Uh, da, da, da. Topped up as much fuel as I could. We were pretty much at the maximum with the cargo we need to take for this run. And, uh... Alright, thank you. Now let's see if we can actually move. This is where things usually go wrong. And it's going wrong. I don't know why the simulator does that. It, uh, it, like, times out. I hope they get that worked out before 2024. And that's been, uh, it comes and goes. It really does. I haven't seen it for a while, and now it's back again. And, um, so we'll just, we'll just, uh, respawn on the runway. And we'll get going. And we're heading south anyway. Want to do a run around ship rock and then we'll head south. what's on the books for you today I've already got a set up for a job ma'am transporter from dispatch I see you asked for a cargo mission mm -hmm. the ground crew is waiting for you in the parking to load the crates they already have but thanks for thanks for letting us know the ground crew are loading the cargo stand by this was pre-recorded It happened. Funny. All right. Uh, just transporter loading is complete. Let's go. Okay, it still says we're signed into the bush talk. Everything looks good from where I'm sitting. Taxi to the runway and take off. All right. Well, here we go again, folks. Thanks for joining along today. Don't have any strong pull to the left or right today, and that's wonderful. Getting airborne pretty well, considering how Pilot from heavy dispatch. we are. Fly safe. Yes, ma'am. Always. Yes, ma'am. Safety first. Always.
laps up. So yeah, the myth is, if I understood correctly, I'll, I'll play it again here. But the sky, the sky gods brought people down to live on this plateau, and then they would go down into the valley to work on their farms and get water. And then it says lightning struck it. And now nobody, li you know, no nobody lives there but ghosts, and so it's a very holy place, and nobody, they, no they don't want anybody going up there, because you'll disturb the ghosts. But, again, we were talking about large plasma discharges in this area yesterday, forming possibly a lot of the geologic things that we see. And, uh... I mean, I can't imagine how big of a lightning bolt it would have to be to do something like that. If, you know, I mean, if there's any truth to the myth. And there's always usually some truth to myth. Somewhere. So... Shiprock is a monad knock rising nearly 1,583 feet above the high desert plain of the Navajo Nation in San Juan County, New Mexico, United States. Its peak elevation is 7,177 feet above sea level. Governed by the Navajo Nation, the formation is in the Four Corners region and plays a significant role in Navajo religion, myth, and tradition. It is located in the center of the area occupied by the ancient Pueblo people, a prehistoric Native American culture of the southwest United States often referred to as the Anasazi. <coughs> the Navajo name for the peak, Cibit A.E., meaning rock with wings or wind rock, refers to the legend of the great bird that brought the Navajo from the north to their present lands. The name Shiprock or Shiprock Peak or Shiprock derives from the peak's resemblance to an enormous 19th century clipper ship. Americans first called the peak the Needle, a name given to the topmost pinnacle by Captain J. F. McComb in 1860. Shiprock and the surrounding land have religious and historical significance to the Navajo people. It is mentioned in many of their myths and legends. Foremost is the peak's role as the agent that brought the Navajo to the southwest. According to one legend, after being transported from another place, the Navajos lived on the monolith, coming down only to plant their fields and get water. One day, the peak was struck by lightning, obliterating the trail and leaving only a sheer cliff, and stranding the women and children on top to starve. The presence of people on the peak is forbidden for fear they might stir up the ghosts, or rob their corpses. Isn't that insane? So if there's any truth to it, this must have been a nice plateau, and, you know, I mean, you can't even imagine living on something like that now. But also looking at the area down below, you know, these seemingly, I mean, I wonder if these were waterways especially on the other side we're just looking around the other side areas where there may have been in the past abundant water and again it looks very like it could be very lush right against the peak where they may have had all their farming and gardening and you know but right now it's like well how would you get up and down I mean, you have to imagine it just completely... It must have been something... Completely different than what we're now seeing. Horrible. Again, I, you know, who would want to get hit by... Uh, and again, they mentioned the, the period, 11,000 to 12,000 years ago. And all these new uh, age or modern archaeologists, Egyptologists and others... We're always talking about this cataclysm that took place around 11,000, 12,000 years ago. And there's a lot of speculation that one of the other bodies in our solar system came too close and there was plasma discharges all over the place. Now, I can't imagine a lightning bolt. A single lightning bolt. See, imagine, look down there. Like, that would have, seems like, it's almost like a, a water, like a water, uh, basin but again i can't imagine a a, a single lightning bolt <laughs> i've had a lightning i've had plenty of lightning bolts 
you know, strike around me on trees and different things. And yeah, it'll take a tree out. But a single lightning bolt. Devastating uh, civilization living on a plateau right here. Turn it into that thing. No, that's not a lightning bolt. That's plasma. Um, we do know now that electromagnetics can raise and lower terrain. All right, so now I need to head south. And there was a couple of peaks on the uh, bush talk map. We'll just head this way, and then we're going to cut back in. We are really cooking today. When uh, the autopilot get heading. An out hold for right now, and we need to be going so fast. Okay, so looking back over here, uh, ah, uh, I'm missing them. There are these tiny little ones over here. They're actually to the, to the left of us. Doesn't look to be any peaks, though. Back over here, you see what I'm talking about? They're ahead of us. Well, we're heading. I guess these little formations here may have they're significant in some way. Really excited. I've done Chaco Canyon before, and I've spent quite a lot of time. Yeah, well, that's a bit of exaggeration. I have spent time going back and forth and back and forth over Chaco Canyon to try to just see what I can see. And it's been pretty amazing. I don't know what we're going to see today because back in the, the day when I was doing it before, um, I, I wasn't time constrained and I would just spend. I'm just going back and forth and not even really knowing where I was at, but uh, usually along like the riverbeds looking for signs of structure, and hopefully we'll see some today. We're definitely um, going to be on the path to go right through the Chaco Canyon area. another place where the, the simulators splicing together two different maps get that discoloration you'd be getting some uh the bush talk kicking in here in a moment yeah i kind of imagined that what they were talking about was ship rock that had been something like this you know a nice plateau with nice smooth ways to get up and down <clears throat> So it's saying that there's, we should be seeing something here. It is, it is talking about like this formation and this form. 
Cathedral Cliff is a 5,810-foot elevation volcanic plug located on Navajo Nation land in San Juan County of northwest New Mexico, United States. It is a prominent landmark set alongside U.S. Route 491, approximately 13 miles south of the community of Shiprock, New Mexico. Cathedral Cliff is one of the phreatomagmatic diatremes of the Four Corners area, and with significant relief as it rises 400 feet above the high desert plain. It is situated about 9.5 miles southeast of Shiprock, the most famous of these diatremes. Cathedral Cliff is set in the northeastern part of the Navajo Volcanic Field, a volcanic field that includes intrusions and flows of minette and other unusual igneous rocks which formed around 30 million years ago during the Oligocene. Its nearest higher neighbor is Table Mesa, one mile to the southwest, and Barber Peak is set 1.5 mile to the southeast. Okay, so now, back over here, that one is also there. Barber Peak. Barber Peak is a 5,778-foot elevation volcanic plug located on Navajo Nation land in San Juan County of northwest New Mexico, United States. It is a prominent landmark set one half mile east of U.S. Route 491, approximately 15 miles south of the community of Shiprock, New Mexico. Its nearest higher neighbor is Table Mesa, one mile to the west, and Cathedral Cliff is set 1.5 mile to the northwest. Barber Peak is one of the phreatomagmatic diatremes of the Four Corners area, and with significant relief as it rises 300 feet above the high desert plain. It is situated about 11 miles southeast of Shiprock, the most famous of these diatremes. Barber Peak is set in the northeastern part of the Navajo Volcanic Field, a volcanic field that includes intrusions and flows of minette and other unusual igneous rocks which formed around 30 million years ago during the Oligocene. In the Navajo language, this geographical feature is called Tsinajin, meaning black downward rock. Very nice, very neat. Barber Peak is a 5,778 oh. foot elevation volcanic plug located they triggered on it again. Nation. I don't know how to make them stop County, once they've started. West New Mexico, United Let's see. States. Yeah, okay. Pause there. All right, so um, from here, we want to go. Into those out here. Little peak talking about oil rigs. Basically, we need to get we're setting a 113. Definitely got some red in the ground over there. See that ring of red? I wonder if that's uh, iron. Yeah. All right, we're kind of going the right way. Here's uh, here's Chaco, the Chaco Canyon area. Let me change. Add a couple more. Reason here. Okay. This should be uh, approximately the right way. But yeah, you see that? Look at that. Look at 
looked like a, a ring of red in the cockpit. Um, yesterday, as uh, one of our one of my favorite things to talk about, you know, the ancient alien stuff, and we we're talking about how around the world there's so much stuff, but here in North America, we're like, man, where, where's our stuff? I think it's here. I mean, I think it's everywhere in North America, but considering Chaco Canyon and some of the large, large, large structures, and then you get stuff like that, the mythology of ship rock. And the great bird bringing the Navajo people from the north. Or the Pueblo people, whomever, to start living here. And this must have been an amazing area. And again, you can't look at it today and think, well, why would anybody want to live here? I mean, the, the earth has changed so much. There's been so much look, climate change. There's been a lot of it. You know, the idea that you could take boat rides next to the pyramids. I mean, uh, now all you see is desert when you think of pyramids and sand and desert, and it just wasn't. It was lush and wonderful, and everything was painted in day-glow colors. And same with this. In the past, uh, I imagine this was so beautiful. And I believe that there are probably, if we would keep spending the time to dig everywhere, we would... Uh, find wonderful stuff like that that there was lots of civilizations out here because you look at Chaco Canyon today and like why why would anybody build out here no it must have been different and they're massive complexes Hello, Chris. I, I love her. I love her to death. I love her so much. I really, I mean, I can't live without her. But, it, you know, it's one of those. You know, she does know that I'm streaming for the last three days. And it's not, I don't mind, you know, hearing, you know, you hearing her call in, da 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 da. But, but she does it, and then I tell her I'm streaming, and then she acts so disappointed, like, well, well why don't you want to talk to me? Uh, okay, I'll talk to you later. Shouldn't be talking crap about Christine uh, on a live stream. <laughs> but she does. If you just listen to the last couple of... Uh, shit, I, any live stream... Any live stream that I've done, she she will pretty much call during the live stream. Are you live streaming today? I am. Okay. And then gonna get a call. And I don't mind. I mean, you get to know Christine too. But oh, there she's there she is calling again. I let the first one go to try to just let her know hey, today I'm not answering because I'm streaming, and she just called right back. Only to sound terribly disappointed when I told her I'm streaming. That's anyway. Uh, I, these trips, these cross countries, now that I'm starting to do, um, now that I'm adventurous, I'm you know spent most of my time in the last few few years just learning to fly and watching all the flight videos and learning about navigation and it just everything that I could possibly absorb and then testing it all and trying it all and learning it all in the simulator and I just mostly flew around Colorado because there was no need for me to go anywhere else I mean not into sightseeing I was into learning and now that I'm starting to do these cross countries which you would have to do anyway as part of your training um, it's really wonderful I mean I've driven a lot around a lot of the United States but seeing it from the air is, is entirely different, and I'm just really, really enjoying the differences. I mean, it's definitely not all the same. Like when you're heading out east, 
beyond Colorado and just out east, a lot of it looks the same. And this, to me, in, in a lot of ways, visually more exciting than a lot of the just flat green you see going out east. You know, and then I see things like that and my mind gets going. I look down there and I see these big areas of red and I'm like, you know, I wonder if there was a ancient industrial stuff going on out here. You know, and now it's all like buildings. Imagine buildings all rotting and going back into the earth. They would create things like that on the surface. Metal buildings. Could just be, you know, it just be iron that's you know oxidizing or rusting on the surface and you know going back to what I was talking about you know we know people lived out here Let's take a look at our map and let's zoom in down to like a street level and see if there's anything to see. No, there's a little road here. And 5080. How do you even pronounce that? That sounds Arabic. Burnham. This stosh god. That's about the area I was talking about where there's all that red. Well, we have a minute, so I might as well look that up. Um, let me open up another window over here. This ta, this ta, the cod. Navajo chapters. Be a self-governing entity promoting infrastructure and economic development to benefit the this ta, the cod Burnham community while safeguarding the environment. They've got some neat rock formations that we're not seeing from up here, but like spires. Like spire formations that we can't see from up here. Let's see if there's any other information I can find out about it. Is a cultural feature. It, Burnham chapter is a cultural feature in San Juan County. The primary coordinates for Burden are da 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 da. da. Map locations. But no history at the moment. The dining, they're talking about the dining you can experience there. They're talking about the roads got paved a couple of years ago. Uh-oh, letters treated like animals, Navajo Times. Burnham. Man may not be missing, Marine Vet, I am a... A missing marine.
Free coal program opens at Navajo Mine as residents prepare for dot dot dot. So no, not getting anything else on that. All right, let me get in the cockpit and change our degrees just a tiny bit. Now we're starting to come into the... Paco area. So keep your eyes open. You might, you know, you might see things. You know, definitely look for things that look like, you know, corners and structures and definitely along these, these washes. No, I need a couple more degrees. I think that's going to be it right there up ahead. Yeah, it's, you know, you got to imagine a time when this was large flowing rivers and green everywhere and abundant food and wildlife I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna push the computer a little bit harder today since we are now going to um, be checking out this area so I'm gonna go ahead and start bumping up the terrain level of detail it might take a little we might take some hit in frames but I'll go ahead and try pushing it to 140 and hopefully we don't overheat either. Um, we don't really need buildings to be high at the moment. Well, I'll just leave that there. But now we're up to 150 in the terrain. There was there's something there today looks like homes those are homes down there could have been something there something there There's homes all along here. Oh, I need to add more. Rough course a tiny bit. Uh, not much. A lot of some homes down there. I look down here things like they're like in the ground look for patterns that's modern But it looks like it's sitting on something. 
the back like a Kiva. Need to turn for what was there. They're usually over the stuff I've seen. It's usually over in there, but it's been a long time. And I'm no expert on the area, that's for sure. An enthusiast. They have at least covered Chaco Canyon and ancient aliens and. Or at least a lot of programs like that. Because of how massive and tall some of the structures are. And hopefully I have us on a course that we might actually see some of it. Or the major complex. Now I'll have to try to make that a different episode and just concentrate on getting it all mapped you know and then they say things like we don't have any evidence that people actually lived there they built these giant structures out here but they didn't live there and I'm like well maybe it was like in old school Las Vegas back in the day you know they had all these major waterways and maybe they just travel and they you know said that looks like people would just come for celebration the gambling you know who knows just a resort town at, in the past maybe Fly a little bit more that way towards that marker. Chaco Culture National Historical Park is a United States National Historical Park in the American Southwest hosting a concentration of Pueblos. The park is located in northwestern New Mexico, between Albuquerque and Farmington, in a remote canyon cut by the Chaco Washington containing the most sweeping collection of ancient ruins north of Mexico. The park preserves one of the most important pre-Columbian cultural and historical areas in the United States. Between AD 900 and 1150, Chaco Canyon was a major center of culture for the ancestral Pueblones. Chacones quarried sandstone blocks and hauled timber from great distances, 
assembling 15 major complexes that remained the largest buildings ever built in North America until the 19th century. Evidence of archaeoastronomy at Chaco has been proposed, with the Sun Dagger petroglyph at Fajada Butte a popular example. Many Chacon buildings may have been aligned to capture the solar and lunar cycles, requiring generations of astronomical observations and centuries of skillfully coordinated construction. Climate change is thought to have led to the emigration of Chacones and the eventual abandonment of the canyon, beginning with a 50-year drought commencing in 1130. Comprising a UNESCO World Heritage Site located in the arid and sparsely populated Four Corners region, the Chacone cultural sites are fragile, concerns of erosion caused by tourists have led to the closure of Fajada Butte to the public. The sites are considered sacred ancestral homelands by the Hopi and Pueblo people, who maintain oral accounts of their historical migration from Chaco and their spiritual relationship to the land. Though park preservation efforts can conflict with native religious beliefs, tribal representatives work closely with the National Park Service to share their knowledge and respect the heritage of the Chacon culture. The park is on the trails of the Ancients Byway, one of the designated New Mexico Scenic Byways. You know, were these grain pits or were those storage areas or were those luxury resort rooms? Because that one's got like a doorway on it down there. This one here. See the doorway entranceway coming in? You know, were these, you know, and did, did they have roofs at one time? These stories of these structures over here to the north and these walls back here, these are like two or three stories tall. And these all look like rooms and supports. So, you know, you can imagine, uh, again, I, you know, how much of this in the past was sealed off. And then again, if you keep looking around, I mean, that's just not the only place that there's, there's places all over the place up and down if you keep going around the areas right so what is you know i know normally i thought that you know circular structures were called kivas and they were you know ceremonial places but they seem like just housing i don't know i haven't spent enough time finding out what people know or what people um you know what what they're currently saying but uh you know again if you take the time to go back and forth along all of these areas there's another one you're going to find more and more and more and then stuff that you can't see above the ground you'll see just lines in the ground where it looks like other structures were but make no mistake about it this this was massive Stevie, uh, again, looking out here, going this way again, you can see the edges and clearly see stuff here, but then you can see line markers coming out here, and you can see a curve here. Maybe I'm just reading into it, you know, reading, but that, I mean, over here, look, at there seemed like there was something here to me. And as we... Pull back a little bit and look around the surrounding areas. There's a circular structure, circular structure. There's a straight line here. There's like paths that went out here. There looks like there's stuff here under the ground. It looks like there was another complex here. It looks definitely like there was more out here. So I'm glad. I mean, they've uh, definitely um, put stuff here. The, the first times I was coming through it, they didn't have anything. 
you could see kind of the, the stuff on the ground, the area where the roads went to, but now they've got 3D stuff there, which is awesome. Thank you, Asobo and people who uh, add stuff like that into the experience. But again, I believe that if you, again, I would just spend hours going just back and forth up to that, up over there, and go zigzagging back and forth, trying to explore all these areas, like, look at all that in there to me. That looks like stuff. That there was stuff in there. Could be wrong. But, until somebody goes digging, you don't know, but it sure seems like there's still a lot for us to discover. Like, boy, the age of adventure is over. I don't know. I don't know. If there's something here as we keep traveling along this route. And there's more there. Yeah, that we were looking at that one. Looks like there was stuff there. There was something here, and there's still something there. Something there. Something over there. There's modern structures over there. Fascinating. Fascinating, fascinating. Okay. So from here now we need to head this Pueblo Pintado. That we headed over there. Oh yeah, if we keep going forward, I want I didn't have it. I forgot about it, but Los Alamos. We wanted to check out Los Alamos. And we're pretty much heading in the right direction. Two degrees. So the Los Alamos National Laboratory is up ahead, and then the Bandelier National Monument. Santa Fe is beyond that, but we'll be turning south. All right, well, let's look up Pueblo Pintado. This place actually has a wiki. It's a census-designated place in McKinley County, New Mexico. Population was 247. That 247 people in 2000. According to the United States Bureau, the CDP was total area of 10.5 square miles. Ancient Pueblo people's great house ruins in this census-designated place.
All right. Uh, according to da 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 da, da. 247 people in 72 households, including 52 families. The ruins of an ancestral Puebloan great house stands in the area 16 miles east of Pueblo Bonito, part of the Chaco Canyon area. The name Pueblo Pintado is a Spanish for painted village. Named by a guy during the eight, in 1849 expedition, the great house is estimated to have had 90 rooms, 14 to 16 kivas, and there's a great kiva to the south with an interior diameter of 58 feet. Three ring dating puts the construction of Pueblo Pintado at 1060 to 1061 AD during the height of the Chacoan construction period. Well, we'll definitely if we can see that that structure. Altitude. imagine that's that's modern i think that would be it largest thing standing out out there had 90 rooms bunch of kivas no that's modern this is all modern stuff over here and this one you don't even you don't even see it I don't see it. And there's no trace in the... There's really no trace in the earth of it. Or they haven't, you know, it's just... They haven't put it in, but usually with you'd at least see something. But no, no trace of it. But again, 90 rooms plus a bunch of kivas. Anyway, they say it was here, right here.
Hey. Oh, I hope the uh, playback isn't choppy. When I raised the uh, terrain level of graphics, I um, induced some encoder lag. And um, we're not dropping a lot of frames, but again, any frames dropped could result in choppy streams. So let me drop that back down. Really needed that just for Chaco at the moment. my stats <laughs> we should probably go up a little bit higher. We'll probably have to go over that. Uh, let's see what the sky vector says for rain elevations. Eleven thousand. time for a coffee break there's not much in between here and there
Yep, long way away from a Walmart down there. This is where I would imagine your local farmer's market, wherever you're at, is uh, very, very handy. Good idea to know all the farmers and ranchers in your area. Oh, that's like a... What that is? It's like a wall. Those are walls. There was something there. A wall that built. There was a building there, and then another building over there. Like there was even a third in the back. An airport. Probably better turn a few degrees again. Well, we're only dropping seven frames out of like 28,000. Is that right? 28,920 frames, and we've only dropped seven. Um, wonder if I can get it to zero. Could be because I got all these other websites open as well. But let's see what that does. So far, zero drop frames.
I'm so impressed with this computer. I mean, it, you know, if you're looking at this and going, wow, this looks really, really great. Maybe uh, going uh, into the start of next year, uh, I've been saving and saving and saving. And uh, I'm going to now consider getting a new rig. When I bought this rig, I wanted to get into the um, the alpha testing for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And they wanted machines of all types. And they're like, look, we're actually more interested in low-end, medium and low-end machines at this point. Because a lot of these professional pilot simmers, they've all got, you know, the Uber rigs. They're like, no, no, we're, we're really looking for a bunch of alpha testers that are low to medium end. And so I... The machine I had didn't cut it. And I didn't want to splurge on a brand new rig. And they said they weren't even looking for people with the best stuff. And I said, okay, well, I'll go with the, I'll go with mid range. I'll just try to just meet the, like the minimum requirements. And so I found a, an affordable Dell was brand new and, um, very mid range at the time graphics. It's the RX 580. Yeah, the RX 580, that's doing all of this. And um, I'm averaging 60 frames a second right at the moment with the configuration and zero drop frames. And, um, I, you know, I have been absolutely impressed by the this this dinky machine doing everything that I've needed to do this entire time. And um, again, like I said, the, mostly the first couple of years, just learning to fly. Didn't matter how good the graphics were for me. I just wanted to practice all the stuff I was learning. And so it will be interesting to see you know, what kind of performance I can get. I don't think I'm going to go super hog wild spending tons and tons of money, but I would really want to get a good rig before uh, 2024. And I'm waiting to find out more people publish more because it's going to be have multi threading and da 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 and new code. And it's like, so which CPUs and are going to uh, best suit something like that? Because up until this point, it's all been basically like talking about single threads. I don't know. Just a lot of stuff I don't know. But either way, looking to really get a, a good machine. And um, but this is still just this has been fantastic. And even for that little short run that we did there, dropping seven frames, we had the terrain up to 150. It probably pushed it to 200. We didn't get any overheating. Just a nice balmy 70 degrees. Uh, and that's mostly because I don't have the fans at 100%. Right now, I've got the fans at like 85%. I didn't, uh, because I don't have music going, and I've got the um, engine noise rule down pretty low. I didn't know if you end up hearing the fans or not. But I can actually turn them up a little higher. I'll probably keep the... GPU in the uh, mid 60s. Like we're getting some weather. Well, at least clouds up ahead. Bone to Cuba, folks. Cuba landing strip. Up ahead, the Jimez National Re Recreation Area. Be there in just a minute or two, and then beyond that, Valles Caldera. And then beyond that, Los Alamos. Then we turn south to the Bandelier National Monument. 
and head down towards Albuquerque. We're going to be flying past a place called Rio Rancho. Uh, Walter White's house is listed. I don't know that we're going to get low enough to see that, but we can try. Kirtland Air Force Base. Petroglyph National Monument, which you can't see. It's just we're too darn high for something like that. I went looking yesterday to find out anything I could find out on the drone rotation and why the drone rotates and nobody's got any any solutions. Everybody's experiencing it and nobody knows why. Pretty impressive little mountain range here. We're coming into that... Uh, Jimez National Recreation Area. Up oh, five frames. You encoder lag. Must be all the trees. Shoot, I don't think I set the uh, stream right for 60 frames. I think it's still set to 30. I don't know if that'll make a difference or not. But I was messing around. Again, I've got to get set up for Baldur's Gate again. Finish Baldur's Gate. And that thing is just such a hog. I mean, I look at what we're doing here, and then I go to play Baldur's Gate, and I'm barely getting 30 frames out of the thing. Lovely. Lovely, lovely.
Got a ring of clouds around us. This is some spectacular terrain. You know, not real scary, and I, you know, it's just, it's fantastic. No real jagged peaks, everything's just rolling. And this is the recreation area right here up ahead. And a body of water down below, right? Uh, Macaulay Hot Springs. Macaulay Hot Springs, also known as Macaulay Warm Springs, is a thermal spring in the Santa Fe National Forest near the Hema Springs area of northern New Mexico. The spring water cascades into a number of smaller and deeper soaking pools in a clearing in the forest. The warm mineral water emerges from the ground at 99 degrees Fahrenheit and cools to between 85 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit as it flows into the smaller pools. The hike to the springs is four miles on a mildly strenuous, but well-maintained trail. The trailhead is located at the Battleship Rock Campground. Uh oh, did we freeze? Oh, it's paused. Gorgeous, gorgeous. The weather is causing a little bit of lag. 0.1%. Nine frames.
With the haze on the ground, it seems so primordial. Is it primordial? Primordial? Land of the Lost. Chaka Canyon. So, that caldera. Um, it's it's be it's past us over our left shoulder. But let me go ahead and play that. Valles Caldera is a thirteen point seven mile wide volcanic caldera in the Hemas Mountains of northern New Mexico. Hot springs, streams, fumaroles. Natural gas seeps and volcanic domes dot the caldera floor landscape. The highest point in the caldera is Redondo Peak, an 11,253-foot resurgent lava dome located entirely within the caldera. Also within the caldera are several grass valleys, or valles, the largest of which is Valley Grand, the only one accessible by a paved road. In 1975, Valles Caldera was designated as a national natural landmark by the National Park Service, with much of the caldera being within the Valles Caldera National Preserve, a unit of the National Park System. History Use of Valles Caldera dates back to the prehistoric times. Spear points dating to 11,000 years ago have been discovered. Several Native American tribes frequented the caldera, often seasonally, for hunting and for obsidian, used for spear and arrow points. Obsidian from the caldera was traded by tribes across much of the southwest. Eventually, Spanish and later Mexican settlers as well as the Navajo and other tribes came to the caldera seasonally for grazing with periodic clashes and raids. Later, as the United States acquired New Mexico as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, the caldera became the backdrop for the Indian wars with the U.S. Army. Around the same time, the caldera and its forest began to be used commercially for ranching and logging. So, I'm not... unless that is it out there. That looks like a, uh, an airport, though. I'm wondering where... if that's the... Uh, it, right here, the... The Los Alamos n uh, National Laboratory. They're saying that's Los Alamos and that's Los Alamos. Looks like a university. Pause here for a minute, and I'll play this. Los Alamos National Laboratory, Los Alamos or LAM for short, is a United States Department oh, of it. Energy National Laboratory. Organized during World War II, its initial mission was the design of nuclear weapons as part of the Manhattan Project. It is located a short distance northwest of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the southwestern United States. Los Alamos was selected as the top-secret location for bomb design in late 1942 and officially commissioned the next year, under the management of University of California. At the time it was known as Project Y and was the center for weapon design and overall coordination. Other labs, today known as Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the Hanford Site, concentrated on the production of uranium and plutonium bomb fuels. Los Alamos was the heart of the project, collecting together some of the world's most famous scientists, among them numerous Nobel Prize winners. The site was known variously as Project Y, Los Alamos Laboratory, and Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory through this period. The lab's existence was announced to the world in the post-World War II era, when it became known universally as Los Alamos. Far out. Okay, we need to turn south. Oops. Do to do. Come on.
We're dropping back down 7,000 feet, 7,9. Don't so probably start coming back down. And we need to go over a few more degrees. Line us up with the Bandelier National Monument. Dropping a lot of frames again because of the weather. It's funny, that, yeah. Well, the weather, of course, it's going to introduce some stuff. Let me go ahead and pull back a little bit here. We, you know, since we really can't see too much with the haze, we might as well pull it back a little bit. Bandelier National Monument is a 33,677-acre United States National Monument near Los Alamos in Sandoval and Los Alamos counties, New Mexico. The monument preserves the homes and territory of the ancestral Pueblos of a later era in the southwest. Most of the Pueblo structures date to two eras, dating between 1150 and 1600 AD. The monument is 50 square miles of the Pajarito Plateau, on the slopes of the Hemas volcanic field in the Hemas Mountains. Over 70% of the monument is wilderness, with over one mile of elevation change, from about 5,000 feet along the Rio Grande to over 10,000 feet at the peak of Ferro Grande on the rim of the Valles Caldera, providing for a wide range of life zones and wildlife habitats. Three miles off road and more than 70 miles of hiking trails are built, the monument protects ancestral Pueblo archaeological sites, a diverse and scenic landscape, and the country's largest National Park Service Civilian Conservation Corps National Landmark District. Two-thirds of the park, 23,267 acres, is designated as the Bandelier Wilderness Area. Motorized travel and permanent structures are forbidden in the wilderness. Bandelier was designated by President Woodrow Wilson as a national monument on February 11, 1916, and named for Adolf Bandelier, a Swiss-American anthropologist who researched the cultures of the area and supported preservation of the sites. The park infrastructure was developed in the 1930s by crews of the Civilian Conservation Corps and is a national historic landmark for its well-preserved architecture. The National Park Service cooperates with surrounding Pueblos, other federal agencies, and state agencies to manage the park. Wow! Imagine hoofing up and down these all day long. Go visit your grandma, but she's all the way over there on the other side of the valley. That gorge. Well, go. Ugh. Imagine how thick your calves would be. <laughs> Living in an area like this. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so awesome, though. Alright, let's, uh... 
find out where we're at and get on a vector. Now we're pretty much on it. Maybe five degrees. All right, next destination is Albuquerque. Got family. Well, I had. I mean, they've all, you know, everybody's. I mean, they still have family out there, I think. But so many people have passed away recently. It's so sad. We used to do trips out to New Mexico. And uh, pretty much everybody that we would visit now, they're all gone. was turning for a minute but well, that helped a lot only one percent but uh, again we're not so hazy right here down to one frame so hopefully it hasn't been a, it isn't an on playback, isn't a choppy experience. From where I started like four days ago, man, that first day, that getting back, I thought my settings were right. They were completely wrong. I went and did the, I'm, you know, creating chapters with all of these and then go back and do all my time stamps after um, the episode is up, you know, finished. And um, that first day, I just, sorry about it. Then a little bit better yesterday, and a little bit better, or the day before, and then a little bit better yesterday, and hopefully today I've been trying to fine-tune everything and get everything optimized so that, yeah, that not only does it run right on the computer, it, OBS has got what it needs and not dropping frames and not choppy, and, and hopefully today I've got things working right so that, you know, I'm not having black screens. When I switch between... I was switching over here yesterday to this one and had an extra window open. And so every time I would switch over to this map here, the uh, Bush Talk Radio, it would just go to black screen. So I deeply apologize for that for yesterday. I'm so sorry about that. Everything seems to be working fine today, though. When I switch over, those cause a little bit of lag. So that's where some of it's coming from when I switch between screens. I really hope Pretzel works that stuff out with YouTube. I really want to get back to playing music. Or I really don't want to do anything until um, they work. It looked like a couple of other companies out there trying to hijack everything they're doing. I had 17 copyright violations the day before yesterday. That never happens. So something's going wrong. Somebody, some other people have jumped into the mix and they're trying to claim everything. And they didn't flag me as a copyright and I didn't get a strike. They just want me to share the revenue. And, you know, I'm paying my subscription for that live uh, that safe music so and they're foreign territory like Aruba Barbados they're claiming it's their their copyright it's like, yeah country music and folk music yeah right 
So they said that they would look into that for me and try to get that squ uh, squared away. Uh, on a previous video, it looks like they've already cleared up one of those other ones. So it's not foolproof. There's usually one or two that slip by that cause a copyright error, and that's not much to deal with. You have to fill out a, a, in a form for every single one. And, you know, when it's just one, sure, no problem, 15, 20 minutes, you can get it all taken care of. You've got to take screenshots, and you've got to um, timestamp things, and then fill out a form, and then dispute it in YouTube. And it's all fine when it's just one or two, but there was like 17 of them, 14 to 17 the other day. And I just told them, look, I'm, I've had problems with YouTube in the past. I can't, I, I can't be disputing 14 to 17 individual copyright violations you know as my provider you please go take care of this so they said they'll look into it and um we'll see what happens and hopefully we can get our music back on Three zero zero nine. We haven't done an altimeter this whole time. Three zero zero mountain range uh, the right to the left is going forward albuquerque is straight ahead of us um again when i would visit family out here on one occasion i remember them being so excited to take us all the way up to the top of that mountain over there directly ahead to the left over here so that we could look down at albuquerque it was one Christmas we were out there for a wonderful time. The heck of a drive up there. You don't appreciate things like that so much when you're a kid. I wish I had had a greater appreciation and take, taking photos and other things. But I just remember they were so happy to take us up there. That was a couple more degrees. We did a giant family reunion out here one time. And uh, one of the thing that I remember the most, well, one of the things that I remember the most we all went out for dinner. It was a huge table, like 50 of us. And then afterward, we wanted to go to the movies. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off had just come out. And then so a large group of us went and saw Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And we laughed and laughed. It was five more, five more degrees. So 
minutes to 10. So if you were following me um, playing Baldur's Gate, I'm hoping tonight's the night around 7 p.m. or so I might even get started earlier. I got to work some things out with uh, Chris. And um, but I did some testing last night to see if it was running right and I'm going to do a couple more stream tests with it, but hopefully i get back into it. I'm so close to finishing Baldur's Gate 3. Um, so if you're into that, look for that again tonight or this weekend. Um, I'd really like to get to it tonight. And I was playing Bannerlord, and I never got back to that. I was having technical problems back then. And I was playing... Um, Dark, the can't remember what is a survival one. Gotta get back into that. Recently, um, have an interest in playing Rome 2 again, but that's such a long one. And it's, it, I really don't do individual battles, I kind of let the computer handle it at this point. City Skylines 2 is out, but I'm waiting for them to up, update that. The people have been reporting it's a real memory hog and bad performance, and so waiting for a couple of patches on that. I was really thinking about uh, Total War Pharaoh, but they're saying it's dog poop. And uh, so, I don't know, maybe. I never did pick up Troy for the same reason. They're like, eh, it's all right. How red the earth is here. We can come down again. Yeah, I wonder if it's iron. This is the mountain that we went up on. The Sandia Mountains are a mountain range located in Bernalillo and Sandoval counties. Oops immediately to the east of the city of Albuquerque in New Mexico in the southwestern United States, just due south of the Rocky Mountains southern terminus, part of the Sandia Monzano Mountains, largely within the Cibola National Forest and protected as the Sandia Mountain Wilderness. Its highest point is Sandia Crest, 10,678 feet. That's there over to the, to the left. It's 
it's a huge place. Definitely one of those where if you make a wrong left turn at Albuquerque. What Bugs always says. That's the Air Force base out there. Kirtland. International airports. We are cleared through the Charlie airspace. Petroglyph National Monument is going to be to our right. And again, it's just some rock formations with stuff written on it, so we won't be able to see anything. But we'll play it here. And Kirtland is over here. No, that's Walter. Oh, Walter White's house. <laughs> I suppose... Turn off the autopilot. Let's see if we can go find Walter White's house. It's out here somewhere. Is it El Pollo Loco?
The Saul Goodman was also located here. I wonder if that strip mall where they had, you know, where Better Call Saul, Saul Goodman stuff was with the, uh, the Asian ladies and where he had his little Saul Goodman's office. I wonder if that's out here too. Imagine. Oh no, you never know. This is along this road. Couple more neighborhoods up ahead. A little bit of L you're on in. Been drifting a little bit. From the award winning show Breaking Bad. This is the house where fictional character Walter White lived. How bad Many my graphics are. TV scenes have been filmed here, including the infamous scene of the pizza on the roof. In recent years, a six-foot fence was constructed around the front of the elderly couple's property. The couple, who have lived at the property for over 40 years, described their annoyance with the constant attention given to their property as feeling like they couldn't leave the house without the threat of vandalism. Numerous YouTube videos can be seen showing the lady yelling at tourists. Okay, so we're... Okay, just passed it. All right, so... If you're a, a super fan, it's one of these down there. Just past it a tiny bit. See the street we're on now there, and back. One. Okay, so there's that. The next street up. Coolers. Street, street, street. Okay, so if I've got this right, it's one of these in here. Apologize, this is where my graphics card starts falling off. You know, this is where I need a something new because I can't. It can't. Cut it when it comes to, and I think I have buildings down pretty low because mostly we've been just looking at terrain. Okay, so now let's get back on course here. And we need to go all the way back. So turning. Right. 
turning almost west. 21 to 24. I'll be there. Directly ahead, right at the moment, directly ahead. And Kirtland Air Force Base is out there. Really? Don't want to stall. Gads, man. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll play Kirtland. Atlas One, better known as Trestle, was the code name for a unique electromagnetic pulse generation and testing apparatus built mm. between 1972 and 1980 during the Cold War at Sandia National Laboratories near Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. At over two football fields in length and 12 stories high, Trestle was the largest NEMP generator in the world, designed to test the radiation hardening of strategic aircraft systems against EMP pulses from nuclear warfare. Nice. Built at a cost of $60 million, it was composed of two parts, a pair of powerful Marx generators capable of simulating the electromagnetic pulse effects of a high-altitude nuclear explosion of the type expected during a nuclear war, and a giant wooden trestle built in a bowl-shaped arroyo designed to elevate the test aircraft above ground interference and orient it below the pulse in a similar manner to what would be seen in midair. Trestle is the world's largest structure composed entirely of wood and glue laminate. Wood and glue laminate. All right, so we're right on top of this uh, Albuquerque now. Dreamstar Stadium is an outdoor football oh, stadium, stadium located on the south campus of the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is the home field of New Mexico Lobos football, which competes as a member of the Mountain West Conference. The stadium opened in September 1960 Eesh. and currently has a seating capacity of 39,224. The playing surface, named Turner and Margaret Branch Field, is ah. oriented in the north-south configuration that is traditional for football venues. The stadium sits nearly a mile above sea level, at an elevation of 5,100 feet. Kirtland Air Force Base is a United States Air Force base located in the southeast quadrant of the Albuquerque, New Mexico urban area, adjacent to the Albuquerque International Sunport. The military and the international airport share the same runways, making ABQ a joint civil military airport. Kirtland AFB is the largest installation in Air Force Global Strike Command and sixth largest in the Air Force. The base occupies 51,558 acres and employs over 23,000 people, including more than 4,200 active duty and 1,000 guard, plus 3,200 part-time reserve personnel. Kirtland is the home of the Air Force Materiel Command's Nuclear Weapons Center. The NWC's responsibilities include acquisition, 
modernization and sustainment of nuclear system programs for both the Department of Defense and Department of Energy. Far out. Okay, now we're heading south to past Los Lunas, Rio communities. So Rio, uh, we're going to Socorro. And once we hit Socorro, we're going to go due west to the very large array. Didn't want to miss seeing something like this. We're in the right sector. Yeah. Keep following the road. Like there's some stuff over here. Not listed on our Bush Talk radio. Let's see what Microsoft has to say about these. Is Isleta? I get any read on those yet? But a village proper. Yeah, and this is just going to take us in the Isleta. All right, so we're back. Can't help but think about something like the Nile, you know? Got all that dead land out there. It's, it's probably from all the nuclear testing. Um, but then when you follow this river through, just all the the lush, the lushness along, along it. 
Again, I wonder if this is map splicing that's doing this in that area. Probably is. Satellite map splicing. I don't think we're going to catch it, but over to our left, something on the, uh, the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone is a large boulder on the side of Hidden Mountain near Los Lunas, New Mexico about 35 miles south of Albuquerque, that bears a very spectacular inscription carved into a flat panel. The stone is also known as the Los Lunas Mystery Stone or Commandment Rock. The stone wow. is controversial in that some claim the inscription is pre-Columbian, and therefore proof of early Semitic contact with the Americas. The Los Lunas Decalogue Stone is often grouped with the Havener Runestone, Kensington Runestone, Dighton Rock, and the Newport Tower as examples of American landmarks with disputed provenances. Wow. Yeah, we're doing on fuel. Rate. $800 worth of fuel today. Top up. Just to top up. And I didn't go... I don't think I went full top up because it was the weight was too heavy. So... Only probably used a quarter. Six nine. What is and and seven? So we actually have to go up. High as ten seven for the observatory ten seven eight three. So we're going to head down to Socorro. We can kind of just cut it if we want to. But I wanted to see what Socorro looked like. And then go west. 
And it doesn't really matter. Let's just cut it 30. Up, buddy we've got a um an orange cat that's the best way i can describe him. and the kids named him oliver after oliver and in, in company of the disney whatever it's standard standard orange orange striped cat and he wants to go out so one moment please Yeah, it says it's directly ahead. We're on the right vector, Victor. Still a ways, but it sh can't be long. It's so weird, right when we're heading that area, we get the cloud coverage over there. Almost as if it doesn't want us to see it. A little blemish on my uh, my monitor. That's a dot. No, it's a Microsoft dot. Oh my God, it looks like a little. Booger or something. No, it's a landmark. Getting ready to enter the Sierra La Drones Wilderness Study Area. 
Navajo Indian Reservation to the left the study area directly ahead so the reservation area the reservation is over there study area is directly ahead and then beyond this massive study area is supposed to be the very large array. So give me an idea where we're at. There we are, going into this, the uh, study area. Then right past all of this is a large array. These little peaks don't come up as anything, but there's a lot of little markers through the study area. Again, I opened up the the news today when just when I was logging in, you know, whatever homepage comes up with some news on it, and there was the story again about how there's they've discovered a, another ocean underneath the Earth's crust, and I'm looking at all this stuff, and I'm like, where'd all the water go? Mm, down to the next ocean, under the water, highways of water, same as it ever was. I, I didn't take the time to, I was too busy trying to set out all this up for today, but I, again, I didn't drill down onto it and go reading on it, and it's uh, still, you know, is it, is it salt water? Is it another salt water layer, uh, ocean? Or because it's been through so much earth, is it all fresh water? How deep is the, then I gotta start researching. 
you know, how deep is the crust and where's the, where is it at its thinnest? And if you drill a hole, will it flood the earth? And <laughs> is that what happened the first time with the great flood? Somebody's like, hey, you know, there's a high, there's another ocean. Well, let's get to it. They did They're like, oh, uh, um, we can't plug it. Um, <clears throat> probably not, but. But again, you know, uh, everybody's like, the Earth is running out of what we're running out of space. We're running out of space to put people. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. We're running out of space, huh? Uh, oh, uh, and we're, we're we're running out of water. Uh huh. Oh, oh and climate change. Uh huh. Keep talking. So yeah, it would be fan. It would be neat to see, uh, you know, what they're describing, what they think they're describing. Uh, who in the heck found? How could? How did they find that? That an old H.G. Wells expedition that's finally bearing fruit, you know. Journey to the center of the earth kind of stuff. And they they predicted that, right? And that goes back to that idea. Remember? In like the journey to the center of the earth, there were oceans. In those movies. I swear, unless my brain is fried, I, I swear that they had found oceans inside the earth. Still got to wonder. I think they were all, they had like, you know, because the inner core, they had like an inner sun. I wonder if it's like that or if it's more like Menzo Berenson. You know, it's all dark. Who knows? I, you know, wow, though. Yeah, she was, what, 1850s probably? 1800s anyway <clears throat> Jules Verne he was the journey to the center of the earth right but yeah we're an industrious people I'm sure we could figure out how to Get a hole down there. In a straw. Getting close. We're about halfway through the uh, the study area. All of this out here. I wonder if they're saying that's it over there. Because it says it's up on 10,000 feet, and down there, there's it wouldn't be there. It looks like we're heading to it, but again, it could just be a couple of, you know, it's hard to tell when you're high up. It could just be a few degrees off. If 
few degrees here it makes a big difference there. I would really like to know people that have I haven't uh, really figured out if the people that have the super end super high end graphics cards, you know, are are they still kind of getting buildings doing the same thing even though they have the high end stuff or are they able to really photogrammetry the cities really well? I'm thinking like Las Vegas, you know. I would really like to do an extensive city tour like the volocopter something that we can be right on the street level and uh but i don't i'm i don't i don't need to figure out if i can configure my system to do just the opposite of kind of what we're doing now we're all the you know it's mostly meant to make the terrain look good flip everything around put it towards buildings and see if we can get all of las vegas to show up good but i can't imagine i you know i'm definitely thinking i'm going to need a better machine and do some of those things like after 2024 but we'll see i'm hoping 2024 just rocks i hope it just rocks our world it's another big paradigm shift microsoft flight simulator is really i mean a, a historic achievement and i don't say that lightly it is a it's a paradigm shift i mean think about where we've come from beginnings of flight simulator to this I show people this and they're like, I had no idea it was this good. And I'm like, it's not even this good. I'm using a crap computer. Well, forgive me, computer. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm using a, a you know, a low end mid-range, low to mid-range computer. Holy moly. This is, this looks amazing. Uh -huh, I know, right? This is amazing. You can see your house. Um... But they're talking about so much more, like, career-oriented stuff, in which, you know, you need the terrain to look much better. And maybe it's just to certain areas that they've created. I don't know how it's going to play out. But I really do hope the potential is there that... that at a ground level, it's much more improved. I've also really... I, I wish... I, I don't... I'm not a developer i'm not a that kind of creator i don't know how to create things for microsoft flight simulator but i know that they now have a, like a car you can drive but i'm like what's the point of driving a car all the roads in my computer they just the roads look crap and you know i can't imagine driving around and the graphics the carl g Yansky very large array is a centimeter yeah. wavelength radio astronomy observatory located in central new mexico on the plains of san augustine mm -hmm. between the towns of magdalena and datil 50 miles west of socorro the vla comprises 28 25 meter radio telescopes deployed in a y-shaped array and all the equipment instrumentation and computing power to function as an interferometer each of the massive telescopes is mounted on double parallel railroad tracks, so the radius and density of the array can be transformed to adjust the balance between its angular resolution and its surface brightness sensitivity. Astronomers using the VLA have made key observations of black holes and protoplanetary disks around young stars, uh -huh. discovered magnetic filaments and traced complex gas motions at the Milky Way Center, probed the universe's cosmological parameters, and provided new knowledge about the physical mechanisms that produce radio emission. The VLA stands at an elevation of 6,970 feet above sea level. It is a component of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. 
The NRAO is a facility of the National Science Foundation operated under cooperative agreement by Associated Universities Incorporated. In popular culture, the VLA has appeared repeatedly in American popular culture since its construction. The VLA is present in the 1984 movie 2010, The Year We Make Contact, as the location where Dr. Floyd and Dmitry Moisevich discuss the upcoming missions to Jupiter. The VLA is present in the 1997 movie Contact, as the location where the alien signal is first detected. That's better. Okay, so they don't have these things in 3D, but there they are. Alright, they're all on their own rails. And you can see the shadows of them, right? So if I zoom in again. That's what you're seeing there is... That's the shadow of a dish. That's too bad they don't have these modeled. Okay, but look at how many there are. That track goes way out there. I don't see too many out there, though. But maybe they're going to add to it, you know? And I totally remember the scene with Dr. Floyd. Haywood Floyd. In 2010. He's trying to convince that... Or he's talking to that Russian about... Uh, Getting back to the uh, the spaceship. Matter of fact, let me play that scene. Let me go over to YouTube real quick. At least we can listen to it. Can't. I don't think we're gonna play it, but I'll. Uh, we can listen to it. I'll bet you they have it. No, I'm not seeing it. I'm sure it's out here. I'm sure they have the clip. <clears throat> I'll look one more time. I can't find it.
they have tracks going all the way out there so they can and, you know and again these maps are old these satellites so you never know they've added on to I haven't done any you know seen any news stories on it lately Now I think all that's left is now was there anything south? Do I have anything planned? I did after here I wanted to head 98 degrees and take us into White Sands the, uh, the Trinity site alright so from here go of course, heading And the lowest point is 9,000, so... Um, eight. Turn everything back down. <clears throat> I did the best I could to get the resolution there. But they're not modeled. As you see. As you saw. It's very bad for... Doesn't that Russian tell him it's very bad for my asthma? Yeah, because the Russian guy is trying to convince Dr. Floyd to go on the mission. Alright, we had a disruption in the time-space continuum. And we had a disconnection, but it looks like we're reconnected. OBS went red for a minute and dropped everything. Spock, run a level 2 diagnostic. Oh, I took this. I changed course too hard. Going about 120 to 150. Yep. Wasabi. They never implemented sticky keys. Simulator. Really used those.
So basically, we're, all of this area is pretty much res restricted airspace. So on an average trip like this, mm, no, we're not going through this. We'd have to go around it. And it's, and it's a, if you look over here on sky vector, so we came from here. Here's the very large array, right, right on this point. We're heading this way into the area, and this is all the restricted space, basically all the way out here. See the blue blue lines with the cross marks or all the dashes yeah this all indicates airspace you're not supposed to go into but because we can in the simulator anything all oh, 9,000 says the ones out there are 10,000 It won't matter if we turn a few degrees. about perspective though like it from the cockpit it's like oh my god we're gonna we're gonna hit it and outside say like, oh psh.
Okay, so I found... I didn't find the, the scene, but I found, like, the screenplay. Neatness. It's a good quality. You'll make someone a fine wife. You are Dr. Haywood Floyd. Who the hell are you? I'm Mosevich. I'm here to talk about your problem. Really? What problem is that? You were... You were chairman of the National Council of Astronauts. Of astronautics. Now you're a school teacher. This was by your own choice? Chancellor of the university, it pays better. What do you care? You were responsible for the discovery mission. It was a failure. Someone had to be blamed. Though it was you. You like being a teacher? I don't think I like you. I just read your final report on what happened to Discovery. You left a good number of loose edges. Ends. Loose ends, yes. Thank you. A good number of questions. Have remained unanswered. You just read that report? Took you this long to steal our secrets? How long does it take for your people to steal ours? Same amount of time. This is very bad for my asthma. You think you could meet me halfway? Maybe. Doesn't take a very smart man to appreciate the risk I'm taking by being here with you, Dr. Floyd. And you are a smart man. This is very bad business in Central America. Very bad. We didn't start it. We're scientists, you and I, Dr. Floyd. Our governments are enemies. We are not. Why don't you just uh, try saying what's on your mind? I want to play a game with you, Dr. Floyd. I don't have any time for games. This is a good game. It's called The Truth. For two minutes, I will only tell the truth. And so will you. Two minutes? Two minutes. Make it a minute and a half. One minute and three quarters. You start. We know where you, we know you are building the discovery too. Go back to Jupiter and find out what happened to your men up there. Also to examine the large monolith. You know that we were building the Alexei Leonov to also go up there. I thought you we were gonna call it the T Top. We changed last month. People fall out of favor. The Leonov will reach discovery almost a year before you are ready. My government feels it's very important that we should get there first. It's a distinction that will look splendid on the front page of Pravda. What other value it has, I don't know. One minute ten. Why are you telling me this? Because there are things we need to know. Otherwise, the same thing that you let happen to your people up there could happen to ours. And we would accomplish nothing. I've got one minute left. About? The small monolith you brought back from the moon. Your government has been very selfish and stupid keeping it to yourselves. You never let us examine it. What have you found out about it? Nothing. It's impenetrable. Tried lasers, nuclear detonators, nothing worked. 45 seconds. Monolith near Jupiter. It is the same. It's even larger. And the computer on board the Discovery... The Hell 9000? Can it be reactivated? Yes. By us? By you? It would take three to four months and you're not familiar with the system. Longer than that, comprehend the data. I thought so. 30 seconds. Here we have our quandary. We are going to get there first. Yet, you have the knowledge to make the trip work. How much more time do I have? You just got yourself an extension. How could you convince your people to allow Americans to go on the flight? It won't be easy. However, I'm pretty good. A Russian craft flown by Russians carrying a few poor Americans who need our help? That also doesn't look too bad. On the front page of Pravda, I don't know if I could convince our people. They wouldn't mind seeing you fail. They wouldn't mind it at all. Carrying Americans. I don't think they would allow that. They didn't have to. Have you checked Discovery's orbit lately? What? Have you checked the orbit? 
What about it? Now it's getting chilly here. This is very bad for my asthma. You know damn well we've been checking it. I have enjoyed our little chat. What is it you're not telling me? You're a smart man, Dr. Floyd. You will know what to do. Uh. You'll know what to do. You've double checked this? Please say you haven't. You are saying you aren't saying anything, Floyd. Something incredible is happening up there. Discovery is being pulled towards us. Oh, Discovery is being pulled toward Io, or pushed away from Jupiter, whichever. Sometimes it seems to be accelerating, other times it just seems to stop. Never seen anything like it. How long before it makes impact on Io? Two, two and a half years. How could we be so goddamn wrong about the orbit? Because we weren't wrong. We weren't wrong. Then, great. Why the hell is it going to crash? I don't know. It's bizarre. Unless it has something to do with that monolith. You see that building behind us? Oh, this is this is a different scene. This is where he's talking with the guy outside of Washington. Yeah, you're a smart man, Dr. Floyd. You'll know what to do. And that's where I think the scene ends right there. Because then it's outside of Washington. Because it says, you see that building behind us? I'm supposed to go in and have lunch in half an hour. There's one good thing about uh, a reactionary president. No health foods. The last one uh, the last one we didn't do lunch. We grazed. You want to know what lunch is about? I'll tell you. We've got uh, two more aircraft carriers near Honduras. The Russians are moving in. They're big stuff. We've got the Joint Chiefs screaming about Russian satellites and anti-missile la lasers. So we got to send up our laser satellites to counteract theirs. The president decided to put the NCA... Uh, decided that the NCA should be first under the Defense Department's, uh, Department's authority. Enough with the crazy scientists spending all this money trying to talk to Martians. Da, 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 da. And we're basically here. There's the Bosque Refuge. Wild, National Wildlife Refuge right below us. And now right beyond that that looks like Trinity Point over there, I would imagine. Let's turn. This is very bad for my asthma. I liked Roy, Schre Roy Scheider a lot as an actor. Didn't know him as a person. Really don't know him any other way than that. But I, I loved all of his stuff. Uh, especially Blue Thunder in the 80s, man. That was one of my favorite films ever. Jaws, I, you know wasn't really into seeing people get eaten by sharks you know I mean I've seen it probably seen all the Jaws movies I don't recall the other ones other than one really it's that the mayor's gonna make the same dumb mistake again uh and then I remember him in Sequest in his final years and that he, you know I, I don't recall what he died from it just does seem he died awful young too young But I really loved him in um, 2010, A Space Odyssey. That was nice. He looked very different from the Haywood Floyd from the first movie. But that's okay. Uh, 
up. Oh, that's Chris calling again. I'll be right back. At the start of the show, I forgot. I was rushing around to get back here and get the show started. I forgot that I had a bagel in the toaster oven. Mmm. -hmm. Very rubbery. Well, those were definitely other test. That, those definitely look like other test areas, although they're not listed on the map. I mean, why else have a giant empty square surrounded by? geometric patterns Yes, something very, very serious took place right here. Hmm. 
And that was like a bunker they watched from. There was a facility in between too. Or if that was at the central point and they were looking at explosions over there or whatever. Then over here. Now, according to this, they're directly north of us, but the points on the on the map in front of us are different. But let me turn and look north. But I don't. Maybe those points over there. All right, we'll turn. Minor scale was a test conducted on June 27, 1985, by the United States Defense Nuclear Agency involving the detonation of several thousand tons of conventional explosives to simulate the explosion of a small nuclear bomb. The purpose of the test was to evaluate the effect of nuclear blasts on various pieces of military hardware, particularly new, blast-hardened launchers for the MGM-134 Midgetman ballistic missile. The test took place at the permanent high explosive testing grounds of the White Sands Missile Range in the state of New Mexico, for which 4,744 tons of ANFO explosive, equivalent to 4 kilotons of TNT, were used to roughly simulate the effect of an 8 kiloton air burst nuclear device. With a total energy release of about 4.2 kilotons of TNT equivalent, Minor scale was reported as the largest planned conventional explosion in the history of the free world, surpassing another large conventional explosion, the British Bang disposal of ordnance on Heligoland in 1947, reported to have released about 3.2 kilotons of TNT equivalent. Wow. All right, going forward. Yeah, Trinity's ahead. Trinity was the code name of the first detonation of a nuclear device. It was conducted by the United States Army at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945, as part of the Manhattan Project. 
The test was conducted in the Hanada del Muerto Desert of about 35 miles southeast of Socorro, New Mexico, on what was then the USAF Alamogordo Bombing and Gunnery Range, now part of White Sands Missile Range. The only structures originally in the vicinity were the McDonald Ranch House and its ancillary buildings, which scientists used as a laboratory for testing bomb components. A base camp was constructed, and there were 425 people present on the weekend of the test. The code name Trinity was assigned by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory, inspired by the poetry of John Donne. The test was of an implosion-designed plutonium device, informally nicknamed the Gadget, of the same design as the Fat Man bomb later detonated over Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9, 1945. The complexity of the design required a major effort from the Los Alamos laboratory, and concerns about whether it would work led to a decision to conduct the first nuclear test. The test was planned and directed by Kenneth Bainbridge. Fears of a fizzle led to the construction of a steel containment vessel called Jumbo that could contain the plutonium, allowing it to be recovered, but Jumbo was not used. A rehearsal was held on May 7, 1945, in which 108 short tons of high explosive spiked with radioactive isotopes were detonated. The gadget's detonation released the explosive energy of about 22 kilotons of TNT. Observers included Vannevar Bush, James Chadwick, James Conant, Thomas Farrell, Enrico Fermi, Richard Feynman, Leslie oh. Groves, Robert Oppenheimer, Jeffrey Taylor, Richard Tolman and John von Neumann. The test site was declared a National Historic Landmark District in 1965, and listed on the National Register of Historic Places the following year. Wow. Vannevar Bush, if I'm saying his first name right. Crazy. Go in a circle. Enrico Fermi. Probably by that. All right, we're getting to the end of the um, today's flight. There's the truth or consequences. Airport seemed like a, a interesting place to land after this today or tomorrow if uh things go well then i'll be back tomorrow we'll just try to find another job now that takes us back west we can explore the other half of new mexico or other points later but today was very productive so i feel good about it um now if i could find the airport ATCS Well, that's pretty good. I had a 
I had us perfectly on the right radio for setting that up. I plotted it over here in Sky Vector, and you see how it says 227. So there, I spun, around, spun us around, got us on 228. And it ended up working out just perfect. Let me click nav now. All right, we are 44.1 miles away. I actually have a a VOR approach and an RNAV approach. So they want us to um, we can come from this way and probably get this land, but if we wanted to follow this at all, they would want us to go to Layin. And once we get to Layin, turn to a core setting of uh, 007, Truth and Consequences, and fly 007 down to the runway. Let's do that. Let's go to Layin. I can't get to the... Can't get the camera to move while we're in it. Okay. I expect you to die, Mr. Bond. Famous last words. I, um, they've been talking about the future of James Bond movies, and Christopher Nolan suggested, well, I and others suggested it. Yes, it was us. We've been out there saying, um, look, it's, you know, everybody gets upset. Oh, he's too misogynistic. He's too that. He's outdated. He's a dinosaur. Da, 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 da. And they take all the fun out of it. And here it is, 2023. And since James Bond was written, a whole lot of different, uh, a whole lot of stories have become declassified. To get to the point, people like myself and others have been saying, please, go back in time. Put him back where he belongs. And therefore, nobody can say anything. Look, that's the way it was back then. Life was different back then. People and society were different back then. In a lot of ways. Let James Bond exist in the time that he belongs. Well, we don't want to just re keep remaking the old movies. You don't have to. That was the point I was trying to make. There's so many 
real life stories. Which I'm sure would have tickled Ian Fleming anyway. Um, to novelize, you know, to turn into novelizations in James Bond stories. So Christopher Nolan, the director, has suggested that now himself. That if you let him make the movies, that that would be something he would like to do. He would like to go back. He's the one who just did Oppenheimer. I think about all the spy stuff that probably took place during everything that we've just talked about. These these nuclear tests and everything else. It's probably why this airport is called Truth and Consequences and has a course setting a 007. You don't know. I don't know. Isn't that a wonderful coincidence, though? How interesting, right? Just of all the na weird names for an airport. Truth and Consequences. And when do we get a 007 course setting? How often do we get one of those? It's just awesome. So I agree, Mr. Nolan, with Mr. Nolan, and other people immediately jump up. We don't want, you know, we don't want 60s movies and, you know, and say, oh, please, just sit down. Sit down. We put up with all of your James Bond movies since the 80s, and, you know, they just, none of them have felt right to me, period. It's just too too different you know actor after octopussy or that or never say never again you know we're old james bond that's where he ended for me and so anything after that these are just other agents that have called themselves james bond but weren't the original james bond that's the way i've looked at everything since that the 007 agents continue and because they've already established all this stuff the bond uh, the you know world universal exports right He's got a history, therefore his family history, and there could be a Bond Junior and a Bond Senior and a Bond this and a Bond that, and they're all still part of Universal Exports and blah, 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 and you can see how there could be a, a bunch of Bonds still alive. Overall, though, if you take all the movies together, he wasn't a great spy because they always ended up finding him out, and they're like, oh. Nice to finally meet you, 007. What? Yeah, everybody always knows about him. You know, of course, probably his plan to, to get caught, but he gets caught a lot, you know. But you got to have a good conflict and showdown. Um, but yeah, even doing a Bond story back in time at this period. I mean, he's just coming off uh, finishing making up Oppenheimer. Might as well put it back then. Keep using the same costumes and locations and set pieces that you just built. Might as well just move right on into it. That way you can do an original CIA Felix Leiter character. How wonderful would that be? I think a, I think a lot's lots wonderful, sir. Lots wonderful. The elevation back here. Look at it from a side view. Uh, Nine thousand feet. So I'll come down another thousand here. They want us coming in at nine thousand feet. You know, when I'm thinking about doing these today and going to these places, I just picked them random because they seem like, oh, that'd be really cool. Or that's really odd. And then as we start getting into the story of things, and it's just so weird, the coincidences that turn up like that. Or that just, they make it 
for a really wonderful little flight adventure for the day. Today was a day was a good day. So thank you for joining me on this flight today. Uh, or if you're tuning in later, checking all this out. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I can't wait to see what tomorrow is going to bring, you know, as we head back west again. I mean, we're heading west again now, but tomorrow we'll make our way over to Nevada. Thirty miles. Unless you fly, unless somebody's a flight simmer, I'm not gonna get that. I'm gonna go snapshot of that. this one. Okay, let me open that up again. And the touchdown zone is Very bad for my asthma. Oh, I got a like today. Thank you so much. Far out. Somebody gave me a like. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
There it is. Seven, right? Yeah, seven. There it is. Yeah, runway seven. Gravel in good condition. Four thousand eight hundred twenty-one feet. Normally left hand, but we're gonna be coming straight in. Proper altitude. Spaceport America, huh? That is not on our on our map. <clears throat> Maybe we'll see that on the way out tomorrow. Oh, excuse me. Again, thank you so much for the like. Every every bit helps. I mean really. Really, really. Truth or Consequences is a city in New Mexico and the county seat of Sierra County. Originally named Hot Springs, it was a part of the Rio Grande Project, an early large-scale irrigation effort authorized under the Newlands Reclamation Act of 1902. It became the Sierra County seat in 1937. By the late 1930s, Hot Springs was filled with 40 different natural hot spring spas, one per every 75 residents at the time, though primarily catering to visitors. The city changed its name to Truth or Consequences as the result of a radio show contest. In March 1950, Ralph Edwards, 
the host of the popular NBC radio quiz show Truth or Consequences, announced that he would air the program on its 10th anniversary from the first town that renamed itself after the show. Hot Springs officially changed its name on March 31, 1950, and the program was broadcast from there the following evening. I'll be darned. Edwards visited the town during the first weekend of May for the next 50 years. This event became known as Fiesta and eventually included a beauty contest, a parade, and a stage show. The city still celebrates Fiesta each year during the first weekend of May. The parade generally features local dignitaries, last year's Miss Fiesta pageant queen, and the winner of Hatch Chili Queen pageant. Yeah. Good chilies. It was heading 007, and we're 5.1 miles from our waypoint. 09. And normally we're supposed to do like a turn, like follow it out for 30, turn, and then come back. We'll just go ahead and do it and see what we get. One point five, one point four. One mile. Should I actually do it by the book. I should have pulled up that and looked at the course setting. Once you hit here, you're supposed to again go. A certain direction for 30 seconds or so turn but we're gonna do it now
And I can see a little off, but that's saying come in there and land this one. Getting one going this way. That one running this direction. direction out there I I'm guessing it's that if we had made our turn properly at the waypoint and done the spun around went back the other way and then turned around then hit the uh, 007 that would align us up for that That's my best guess, and I'm sticking to it.
Transporter from dispatch. Nice landing. Go to the parking and put your parking brake on. I'll be in touch. Contact ground for your parking assignment, then shut down your engine. Eh. All right. We arrived at our destination and didn't crash today. That's always a plus. Let's turn on the landing lights for that. Stand by. The cargo is being removed. All right. Well, we made our money for the day, and that's good. Paid for the trip. Probably still about 60000 in the hole, but after that crash up, the two crash ups the other day, just jostled the plane much too hard. Resulting in, yeah, a lot, a very expensive hull repair. And then the gas has been, yeah, but it was like a $71,000 repair. Another cargo mission completed. Thanks, and see you soon. Well, thank you. All right, all right, all right. We did it. another Ready one in the books. Start. So 69 in the books. Let's go over to my, uh, in the screen here. Let's turn this off so we don't get that constant beep. Like your door alarm being a jar. Change this to that. And with that, thank you. Thank you for your likes. Uh could really use some some new subscribers. I mean who doesn't, right? But uh thank you. I got a like today and I really appreciate that. Today was a fun day. It was very productive. We learned a lot. I learned a lot and a lot to think about. And it was just darn beautiful too. I mean, beauty is in the eye, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? And I thought the terrain that we've looked at today, it's all been beautiful, but something uniquely beautiful about all this all this out here too. Lord, you done made a beautiful planet. And with that, uh crush fingers, I will see you tomorrow same time if not probably delayed till two or three in the afternoon we'll just gotta play it by ear every day and again tonight i'm gonna try and uh, if not tonight hopefully uh soon um this next couple of nights is gonna be busy but i i need to get baldur's gate going again and finish baldur's gate so i'm going to try to start streaming that and again i'm shooting for tonight if testing doesn't go good then Probably Sunday or Monday next week. Keep your eyes open for that if you're interested. Uh, if you're subscribed and you have that little bell notification thing going. So thanks again for today and again, hopefully see you tomorrow. Adios.